have uh, Shantanu Singh here uh, as our GIS invited speaker from our, our genome seminar series. So Shantanu is a computer scientist who somehow lost his way and became a biologist, uh, was still doing machine learning. So he did his bachelor's in computer science and engineering from Bangalore Institute of Technology, did his PhD in computer science and machine learning statistics, bioimage analysis at Ohio State University, and then moved on to a postdoc at uh, Broad Institute. Uh, and he's been at the Broad since 2011, where he's now co-leader of the Carpenter Singh Lab and um, senior group leader at Broad, where you know, he does, uh, his work is based on discovering new therapies for diseases by, by doing machine learning analysis of cell images to understand basic, uh, basic cell biology. And he's really at the forefront of people who are bridging gaps between different fields, you know, machine learning, image analysis, biology, disease mechanisms, and so on. So uh, very thrilled, as I said, to have him here. Shantanu, welcome. Thank you so much, Sham, for the introduction. Um, very, very generous of you. And thank you for the invitation to present our work. I, I will need to perhaps apologize in advance in case there's any trouble with the internet. I'm gonna turn off my video. I'm, at a, I'm in a hotel room. So that doesn't that seamless, and I also have a have a cold of sorts. So hopefully, despite that, we'll still get to discuss science. Okay, so um, today I'll talk about how we use microscopy images of cells to make predictions that may help us find new drugs. And many of you are probably familiar with this. You know, microscopy images are stunning and and beautiful, uh, but what's really even more amazing is the wealth of information that's hidden within these images. Scientists can unlock uh, this information using bioimage analysis software uh, like Cell Profiler, which is a tool produced uh, by our lab, uh, which can help tease apart biology in really quantitative ways. And using those tools, we can, we can measure uh, very specific features or identify specific phenotypes that we care about. And that's impactful. Um, and I won't go too much into that specific approach for so studying images, or you're measuring specific phenotypes or features. Uh, but there is more than a single image or more than a single readout or a single cell phenotype that we can get from an image. Okay, so in fact, within the field of what we call image-based profiling, we assert that by collecting hundreds of readouts from images like this that you're seeing on the screen, we can capture a, an impressively comprehensive view of cell state. Now, we know that to some extent, uh, this has to be true because in classic genetic screens back in the day where researchers introduced random mutations in organisms uh, like fruit flies, observing the same phenotype uh, indicated that genes in the same pathway were perturbed. So the question is now whether we can take that fundamental concept uh, that was used by these researchers back in the day and scale it up. And then this is what image-based profiling is really all about. So just to get us on the same page with uh, image-based profiling, uh, this process is pretty standard for most of our projects. Uh, first, we have a bunch of different things that we wanna test like, like chemicals or genetic perturbations. We expose the cells to, to these and then we just let them grow for a couple of days. After that, we use some fluorescent dyes to mark a, a set of structures in the cell so that we can get a broad readout of the phenotypic state of the cell. And this is called, in this case, the cell painting assay, which we designed to be affordable and efficient. Uh, once we have all these colorful images of cells, we can use the more or less standard computer vision methods to analyze them and measure different features. We take all these measurements that we get from, from these, uh, from these, from these uh, tools and from each cell in a sample. And then that gives us a kind of a fingerprint or profile for the sample. And this is a super effective approach for studying biology in high dimensions because we can now turn uh, our questions into high dimensional data analysis problems. And the problems that we are most interested in in our lab is how do we use that to dramatically impact different stages of the drug discovery pipeline, right? So I'll, I'll just, just talk you through a few of these examples uh, really in the rest of the talk. So it's just starting at the very top, can we use this approach to identify signatures of disease and then just find drugs that can revert them? And I'll just focus on one example <clears throat> of this idea on this front, which is uh, in collaboration with Miko Taipali's lab at the University of Toronto. Uh, we're exploring image-based profiling for rare diseases. For example, we label a protein called LZTR1, or we can see its localization in a cell. Uh, but if we introduce a mutation causing Newton syndrome, 
in this gene, we observe a noticeable change in their protein localization. Now, this clear phenotype allows us to then screen for compounds that may revert the phenotype back to a healthy state, and that gives us a starting point uh, to start thinking about potential therapeutics. Now, just to draw a parallel, in this particular case, you could, you know, you could diagnose this disorder by looking at a human face, uh, just that in this case, we're lucky that we can also see the disease phenotype uh, in the cells that are overexpressing the disease variant. And um, just taking this idea, Miko's lab has generated an image-based profiling data set for over 8,000 Mendelian diseases and 3,500 mutant alleles. Initially, Jessica Lusquist in the lab had characterized uh, protein localization by visually scoring these images. And now Marzia Hagigi in our lab is taking an automated unbiased approach, examining not just protein localization, uh, but also a wide range of morphological measurements to identify unique mutant signatures. So this way we can gain insights into the structural cell changes and screen for drugs that can revert the phenotype. And what's even more exciting is that uh, in the next four years or so, we'll be generating data for about 80,000 or so genetic variants offering an enormous potential for understanding genetic disorders and developing targeted therapies for them. There's a way to truly scale up these screening experiments because now with pooled optical profiling, and this is for a collaboration with the Blaney and Neil Labs of the Broad, we can perturb cells with a pooled perturbation library comprising the reference and disease variants that we care about, and then measure for each cell, not just the morphology, uh, but also the identity of the variant that was all expressed in it. This is done using in-situ sequencing of the barcodes, which is very similar uh, to the kind of in-situ sequencing that you have seen in spatial transcriptomics if you've been following that work as well. So you can overexpress all these 400 or so alleles uh, in every well and then treat each well with a compound and then check across all the disease variants and all the compounds, whether any of the compounds were able to rescue uh, the phenotype induced by the, the variant to make it look similar to the corresponding wild type. So that's one way for you know, screening for multiple diseases simultaneously, which would really accelerate this process. All right, now profiling can be a valuable tool in understanding how potential drugs work uh, by comparing their profiles against a library of chemicals with known mechanisms, we can gain insights into their mode of action. So through this comparison, uh, you, you, know, you, can, uh, you can just identify matches that may reveal the drug's probable targets, and that could provide a more comprehensive understanding of its effects. So last year in this work led by Greg Way in our lab, uh, who started his own lab uh, years, a couple of years ago, uh, touching on these topics, we compared two high throughput profiling assays, cell painting, which looks at cell morphology, and L1000, which examines the transcriptional state of about a thousand genes. We tested about 1500 compounds, mostly FDA approved drugs across various doses. And then we found about a third of the mechanisms in this data set, the compounds were significantly tightly clustered. In this analysis, we saw that morphology consistently outperformed L1000 in terms of the number of mechanisms captured. As you can see with the orange bars being taller than the light blue ones in the plot. Now, excuse me, when we performed a supervised analysis and trained classifiers for this task, the results were more balanced. Uh, the two axes here show a classification metric, which is the area under the precision recall curve for both assays. As expected, some mechanisms of action were better predicted in one assay compared to the other, indicating some sort of a complementarity uh, of uh, relationship between them. Now, a related problem is predicting the, the gene target of a compound, and we could, we could solve this in the same way as we do with mode of action. But what we demonstrated in this collaboration with Pranav Rajpurkar and his team at Stanford was that we could make a significant improvement in classification performance by incorporating additional side information, which is image-based profile of the gene target. We had uh, created a cell painting data set of about 160 genes and 302 compounds that were targeting those genes, or roughly something like two compounds per gene target. You can see a visualization of that in this matrix. Rows are genes, columns are compounds. Blue indicates that the gene is known to be targeted by the compound, and green means that it's either not targeted or is, no, is not known uh, in, in this case. So we split the data by stratifying compounds into train and test, which is the dark, uh, the, the, the dark here in the train and the, and the light to test uh, in this matrix. So we, we then just trained a, uh, a transformer model. It's one of the highly successful deep learning architectures out there to classify gene compound pairs as being true or false. And then for a previously unseen query compound, the model generates a rank list of likely gene targets. We've certainly found that this approach significantly improves on, the, on just simply measuring the similarity between compounds targeting the same gene 
or creating a regular classifier for each gene. So these experiments were done on a, on a relatively small data set, and, and we anticipate that the larger data sets that are now available can truly bring forth the benefit of the strategy. Excuse me. <clears throat> Another application of profiling is to identify uh, gene function by grouping similar genes and alleles. We've tested this idea using genetic perturbations. We had found a remarkable ability to cluster them based on the similar based on their similarity, and this was work done by Mohamed Roban several years ago. Uh, by overexpressing each gene in a cell population and applying cell painting, and then extracting profiles, we can rediscover known biological pathways in a single experiment. For example, the RAS pathway and the HIPAA pathways uh, were found to be tightly clustered, and there are many other such examples in this paper. We also observed meaningful anti-correlations, such as negative versus positive regulators of the same pathway. Uh, and in general, this was like a first foray into identifying and exploring complex genetic relationships and pathways using cell painting. And a very related application to that is using genetic perturbation profiles to potentially predict drug responses for patients. And a step towards that goal would be to uh, stratify patients and, and characterize disease alleles based on morphological profiling. So for example, in lung cancer, the disease can be caused by, uh, by various underlying mutations, but by or expressing each disease associated allele and then, and then comparing their profiles, we can discover groupings of these alleles into some known subtypes. These groupings are broadly aligned with known biology as we saw, but more interestingly, we can see similarities within specific genes. Uh, take BRAF, uh, for example, the similarities in cell painting morphology data mirror what's known about the activity of various alleles. We just or express the wild type and each mutant, compare the resulting morphological profiles to come up with a stratification into likely subtypes. And we can do this for other genes as well, uh, which we did in this paper. And what's really exciting is that morphological profiling isn't disease specific, as you would have seen by now. So we could run it on every variant that's discovered in every sequencing study for all diseases, which could help us better understand the diversity of genetic variants for each disorder. And all the analysis that I've showed you so far was, considered, was considering the profile of a, of a sample at the aggregate level. But of course, uh, single, there's, this, you know, there's single cell data here. So you can probe that into that and then you can get a more nuanced view of what's going on. For example, here we're able to see the impact of known, for known gain of function mutation in BRAF at the single cell level where the, view, where the, the, the blue color here is a reference allele and the orange is a mutant. So you can sort of really get much more fine grained information about this at the single cell level if you choose to. Uh, do that. Okay. Another application is to use cell paint. Uh, to use cell painting is uh, identifying chemical regulators of genes by doing virtual screening. So the idea is that if you have a gene of interest and you knock it out or you overexpress it, and if you get a really distinctive phenotype, you can go and look for compound in, for in a compound database of cell painting data, and then you can just see if you found a match. Now we weren't really sure if this was going to work. Uh, you know, we were really excited to see if it does. Uh, and you know, we, we, we did it, we tried it with a very small pilot experiment where we had only about 69 genes that met this criteria of a strong phenotype. We then tried to match them, match these compounds against pretty small set of, match these genes against a pretty small set of compounds uh, by screening standards, about 30,000 compounds or so, roughly half of which were distinguishable from negative controls. <laughs> We then look for compounds that highly correlated and anti-correlated with the gene over expression. We had known gene compound pairs where it was known that the compound should target the activity of the gene. So we had about 63 of these positive controls sort of built into the, into the experiment here. And we found about 32% of them had correct compounds at the very top of the list. So all that's good, uh, but the proof is really when you can actually try to do a prospective test. So in a prospective test using genes where we did not know what the answer would be. We grabbed you know, seven genes and we made a list of compounds, contacted a few labs that are studying these genes. We were then lucky to find seven labs that are willing to give it a try. Five of the experiments just gave good results, but two of them fell apart for some chemistry reasons, but three of them just really worked. And in all these cases, the top of the list had some compounds that impinged on the pathway that the researchers were studying, which was the expected pathway. One of these was especially exciting. It's a collaboration together with uh, Karen Isinger at University of Pennsylvania focused on uh, HIPAA pathway regulators. We found three really nice regulators, and then we could do a bit of medicinal chemistry using some uh, analogs that had already existed in the library. 
we tested those and then we found that we could kill sarcoma cells. So these are, yeah, dependent sarcoma cell line that's really hard to kill. The blue are our original hits. Then we found some even stronger ones that seem to impact this pathway. But we don't know if they really bind YAP1 directly, but they clearly impact the pathway and reduce the growth of the sarcoma cell line. So we're really excited to follow this up. And, and Anne and Karen have actually started a company to see if they can sort of push this forward into, in, into um, in, further down the, 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 the drug discovery pipeline. <coughs> Excuse me. So painting uh, has a great potential in uh, predicting various assays. Running large-scale assays for drug discovery can be costly and challenging especially when dealing with primary cells, organoids, or whole organisms. Uh, but a few years ago, an international team, including Janssen uh, and, uh, and many others, had shown that a single high throughput imaging assay can be repurposed to predict the activity, the biological activity of compounds in different assays, even those that were examining unrelated pathways or processes. Working with uh, Kevin Yang from Tommy Yakula and uh, Regina Basley's group at MIT, Nikita Moskov and others had combined chemical structure and transcription readouts to predict assay outcomes. Now, depending on you know, the, the threshold that you can set, that you might want to set for uh, the desired accuracy, between 20 to 60% of the assays can be predicted using some combination of these readouts. And these promising results indicated that image data from high content cell assays, like the ones that we've been seeing so far, uh, along with other available information, uh, in this case, chemical structure information or transcription readouts can be used to strategically design chemical compound screens and, and just boost hit rates. Cell painting uh, along the same lines can also be used for predicting cell health markers. Akita Vasquez uh, and her colleagues at the Broad had developed a cell health assay that measures around 70 or so phenotypes that are related to cell health. These characterize uh, these, all, the, 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 the assay in general characterizes uh, a bunch of things, including uh, stages of cell growth and division, programmed cell death, how quickly cells multiply, and other important indicators that give insights into a cell's overall health. We gather the data from uh, about three cell types in the study by altering specific genes, and we studied them using both the cell painting and the cell health assay. We then used the information obtained from cell painting to predict various cell health indicators. Gregory and a group showed that we could accurately predict many of these indicators and thus uh, sort of highlighted the, the utility of cell painting and understanding cell behavior and responses going beyond just sort of predicting a broad set of assays uh, as you saw in the previous study. Now, in another paper uh, last year from Marzi Hagigi, a research scientist in our group, we provided uh, data sets for various tasks involving the cell painting and L1000 assays. We curated data from you know, thousands of compounds and hundreds of uh, genetic perturbations, aiming to find useful ways to translate between these two assays. As, as one example of using this data set, we developed uh, predictive models to estimate the expression levels of individual genes based on their morphology readouts. Now, it turns out, well, this worked only for a small subset of genes uh, using, the, using the baseline models that we had here. It's important to note that we gained these readouts for free just given imaging data. Uh, so these 70 or so genes can now be readily predicted from, from images, from cell painting images at least, um, to, to, to a fairly high degree of accuracy as you see in this plot and in the paper. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just step back a bit. And and then please, I, I've, uh, I'm I'm just going going fairly quickly so that we'll have enough time to to uh, to discuss the specific ideas. I'm very happy to delve deeper into it. But uh, if you have any questions, please keep dropping them in. I'm not looking at the Q and A right now, but I'll be very happy to to delve into that. Okay, so I, I just wanted to just take a step back a little bit. Uh, you know, these are all uh, interesting applications of cell painting, but all of them are on the set of features. Uh, that, that we chose to extract from the cell images. And the question is, can we improve that? Can you come up with a, with a better uh, representation of cell images itself? So the, the standard cell painting workflow, we, we, can, we use Cell Profiler, uh, the tool I told you about uh, a few slides ago, to extract a bunch of measurements that are hand engineered and correspond to specific geometries or intensity variations or neighborhood relationships across all these channels. 
and this suite of features uh, that we extract gives us a, the sort of the, in a high dimensional space uh, all the analysis that I showed you so far. But it'd be so nice if you could just learn uh, the ideal set of measurements that one could extract from these images to maximize information content. Of course, it's a bit of an ill-posed problem because information content really depends on the application at hand. Uh, but what we've learned over the last decade in deep learning is that there's certain training strategies that can produce representations that are useful across a broad range of tasks. So in this paper, uh, in collaboration with the Casido lab, a uh, former postdoc in the group, we trained a model uh, to predict the perturbation to which each cell belongs. It is a so-called uh, auxiliary task or a pretext task. The, the trained model resulting from this can then be used to extract features. Uh, the trick is to you know, drop the last few features and just use one of the intermediate layers as a feature set. We demonstrated a proof of concept of this idea called uh, weekly supervised learning almost five years ago, but to actually get it to work at scale in a way that can replace the standard cell painting feature set uh, took a lot of effort from Ruan's lab to finesse. So using these features, uh, if we reanalyze that overexpression data set I mentioned a little while ago, uh, we see that the learned features are able to do a better job of capturing biology represented in the data. Uh, this red arrow here shows the, the improvement going from the cell profiler feature set uh, to that of the learned model. Uh, and I'll, I'll note that uh, some of these improvements are small, uh, but they are you know, generally consistent across the data sets. And our next step is to now train the model on a data set that's an order of magnitude larger. And I'll, I'll tell you about that data set in a little bit. <clears throat> so, so once again, uh, just thinking about the, the pipeline at large, what else can we do that can accelerate the discovery or process across the board? Now, a big missing component has always been the lack of large cell painting, large cell painting data set that can be used as a reference for all these applications. For example, the assay prediction and virtual screening applications in particular would you know, both greatly benefit from having access to more data, uh, as well as our ability to learn better representations because that, that really a, is a data hog. So in 2019, in fact, uh, we organized, this is almost, uh, yeah, three, four years ago, we organized the, the Jump Cell Painting Consortium. It's a collaboration between 10 pharma companies, several academic groups, and us at the Broad Institute. Our goal was to create the largest publicly available cell painting data set, which currently includes about 146,000 compound profiles and genetic profiles for a significant portion of the genome generated across multiple sites. Now, through this data generation process, we aim to tackle various assay development and computational challenges in cell painting. Uh, to accelerate its adoption in drug discovery while also creating a large reference data set that anyone can build upon. Excitingly, practically all the data is now publicly available, although we'll continue its curation over the coming year. And you can learn more. Uh, you can visit the consortium's website to get more updated information as, as we go along. Uh, but you can also browse the data already using these portals created by two companies, Artigen and, and Spring Discovery, uh, who sort of are providing a really good way of, uh, of browsing both the images as well as the extract features and annotations present in this data set. And I'll be sharing these slides um, in, in the link that I showed, that I sent you, or that I, I'll, I'll post at the end. So feel free to just download it and follow the links from that. Okay. I'm really thrilled to note that the, that the data set is actually already, this is uh, about a month or so, but I haven't checked more recently, but uh, it's, being, uh, it's being used by the community um, we see that in our downloads, but also more concretely in the, in the papers that have been coming out of the lab, out of many different labs over the last months, some from our own partners, of course, but also others who have just taken it and run with it over the last uh, couple of months, in fact. We're working really hard to maximize the information you can get from this data. In specific, we are focused on correcting for batch effects, uh, which is really the bane of our existence. It can really obscure biological signal especially in high dimensional readouts like cell painting. Our goal is to create strategies that not only correct for batch effects, but also facilitate data integration across experiments. This would allow others to build upon the resource we have created by adding their own uh, to this data set. And of course, allow us to integrate uh, all the data that's been generated here to analyze them all at one go. Okay, I, I just wanted to close with, uh, with a quick preview uh, of our next big project focusing on one of the components of this workflow, which is 
can we identify signatures associated with various types of toxicity? So for that, we are creating a consortium of more than 30 organizations to pioneer an integrated approach for predicting chemical toxicity. Uh, current methods for this involve animal testing, which is expensive, has ethical concerns, and is often inaccurate. So the field really needs alternatives. Our consortium will collect data on compounds with known liver toxicity and profile them using multiplex assays using cell painting. And our goal will be to test if simple cheap assays like cell painting can be used to predict whether a chemical will be toxic to humans. And we, can, we think this could be one of the most impactful ways of transforming the testing process in both the ACCAM and pharmaceutical industries. And uh, we were really excited that this, that this project was, um, was, was awarded a grant from uh, the Massachusetts Life Sciences Consortium, which has allowed us to now officially launch it uh, in, in a month or so. So we'll just zoom in a bit uh, about this, uh, this process, what we're going to be doing here. Uh, the major limiting factor in this field is the lack of ground truth. That is a lack of a set of compounds where the correct answer, toxic versus non toxic, is known. So we plan to collect the data that's needed for that. We want to predict human outputs, but there's much more rat tox data available. So partners will donate compounds that have liver, uh, that have a liver uh, rat studies already completed, uh, which, will, which will gather along with public human clinical data. We'll then take advantage of new methods for high throughput profiling, capturing images, mRNA levels, and protein levels for each compound, and figure out whether any of these, uh, any of the biological information in these inputs can predict the outcomes that we care about, in this case, the toxicity outcomes. We use a range of cell model systems in terms of complexity and physiological relevance, and then together uh, address many of the data science challenges that we need to overcome. And ultimately, our, our goal will be to produce not just the data and the methods, but also the community that's well versed in these new approaches to toxicity prediction. Okay, I, that's about all I really wanted to share. I, I thought I'll um, leave plenty of time for questions so we can delve into uh, some of the topics I touched upon. Just wanted to thank our lab and all our collaborators uh, that I mentioned on the individual slides, as well as uh, all our funding sources. So with that, I am ready to take your questions. Thanks very much, Antonu. Uh, so many projects, uh, so much activity in this place. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I see this. Some folks already jumped in. Just wanted to put the word out to everyone. You can use the Q&A button. In on your Zoom screen to post your questions. Uh, I, I think most of you can't post your questions in the chat, but if you are a panelist, you can post your questions in the chat. All right, um, let's jump in, Siri, and thank you so much for leaving room for discussion. So there's so many things to talk about here. Absolutely. So uh, start with uh, Deepika. Uh, wanted to check how many cell types and lineages uh, have been or are being analyzed, and what libraries are you uh, treating the cells with? Great, yes. So we, we've sort of, uh, we mostly stuck with one or two cell lines, which uh, to some researchers has been, uh, has been puzzling. And, and the idea was that we wanted to see, you know, as we are starting off building these libraries, wanted to see uh, with there's so many different dimensions in which we can sort of expand, um, expand the collection of biological information. Right? Uh, we decided that we will sort of focus on chemicals, focus on genetic perturbations, and then try to span as much space as we can by increasing the number of chemical perturbations we test, increasing the number of genetic perturbations we test, and just stick to a single cell line for that. So you're more or less stuck with the U2S cell line. We have the A509 cell line uh, that's also been profiled um, for the FDA-approved drugs that I told you about. Uh, but apart from that, cell painting in general, uh, not in terms of large libraries, but in terms of it's used across different uh, different projects, um, across labs, a span like a bunch of different cell, cell types, uh, erythrocytes, neuronal cells, cardiomyocytes, uh, suspension cells, which I have no idea you could actually do, and the string discovery and others did that. And uh, at least about 60 of the cell lines from the cancer cell line, um, from the, uh, from the uh, gosh, I keep forgetting, the CCL cancer cell line encyclopedia, the Broad, uh, which is now called uh, cell line factory. So there are a whole bunch of different cell lines that are being profiled in cell painting, but in terms of large libraries, right now I would say U2S, single cell line is the one that has the most of it. So the other question is what are the libraries? So uh, in the jump cell painting data set, we profiled from the, the horizons 
uh, CRISPR library, I believe the paper I will link to in the slides will have the exact details of the library if you care about that. Uh, but essentially the whole gene, um, not the whole genome, about 8,000 or so genes from their library. Uh, all the or expression plasmids available at the Broad, um, at the Broad, which is about 16,000 or so ORFs, um, and 116,000 compounds that were collected across different, uh, all the 10 different pharma companies. So you'll have, we have the entire list of uh, compounds uh, available publicly, which you can look up. So that, that sort of spans much of it, plus the FDA approved drugs, about 15, uh, I think now we have about 4,000 or so of those profiled. Fantastic. Um, I, I had a related question, so I'm going to jump in out of turn here. Uh, you referred to other groups um, having tested other cell lines and so on. So how easy is it or hard is it for someone to set up their own cell painting platform yeah. and so, adopt these methods? Like how many teams right now are doing it in the world besides yours? Yeah, so, you know, at some point, Anne and I had the spreadsheet saying companies and labs doing cell painting. And at some point we gave up uh, on tracking, which is great news, right? Um, so I, I think by the last count, which was about two years ago, there were about, you know, practically every big pharma company, uh, a whole bunch of biotechs and maybe about 20 academic labs. But I think now it's really exploded. I, I, I'll have a more accurate number when we have our, uh, we, have our uh, we have a conference coming up in September, uh, the SPI2 conference. I'll just paste that in here in case folks are interested in, I believe, I believe it can be virtually attended virtually. SPI2. Uh, it's in October, October 2023. I believe it's the 30th or something like that. Just gonna paste that into the chat right here. Something like that. Okay, so that that will have a whole uh, session dedicated to cell painting, and I will get a more accurate number then. I think I think it'll be somewhere close to 100 labs. I'm guessing at this point, uh, labs and pharma companies included. Um, so the question was, yeah. You know, so uh, yeah. It's, yeah, no, that's it's really, really encouraging. And I think the um, so the other question is how easy is it to set it up? So prob I, I think I think we should I, I, I think I'll be the wrong person to answer the question because obviously it's very easy for us to just repeat our our own assay. Um, the the sense we get is that if we sort of are just doing standard cell line, like standard U2 or assay five four nine. Mostly just works. I mean, you've sort of, it's a very simple assay in the end. We've no antibodies, just, you know, regular stains. Uh, it's, the whole idea was to make it cheap and affordable. There's a company, uh, I think it's Burke and Elmer, that is now, that is now produces a cell painting kit, I believe. So they sort of, you can they just, you just buy the whole thing at one shot and then you can figure out all the concentrations and all that. So it's like, that's become really, really productionized and nice. What is still, um, what is still at the frontier is sort of adapting it for new cell types. So for, for example, um, one could say that, oh, you know, you're just gonna use the same cell painting panel for cardiomyocytes and adipocytes and neuronal cell lines and all these things. But the thing is that in all those cell lines, the more, the more bespoke you get, like you, you know, you have five channels and you wanna use it to maximally probe the biology that you care about. And it'll be so sad if you're like studying cardiomyocytes and not able to, uh, not able to sort of mark the fibers, the myosin fibers and things like that. So often what people do is they sort of swap out one channel and then, or two channels, and then mark the thing they care about the most in the cell line in addition to, you know, whatever other cell, uh, cell painting dyes are included. So sometimes that's done. Uh, there's something called variant painting that we have where it's one of those, uh, uh, when I talked about or expressing a bunch of rare uh, mutant alleles. Uh, so there uh, we swap out the channel to then mark the protein of interest itself. So you can sort of tag the ORF itself and see where that protein has been localized. So those kind of tweaks, they can, they can probably take a few iterations to get right. But the broad sense I get is that it sort of generally just works and tweaks here and there may be necessary, but it's fairly simple. Thanks very much. Uh, a quick follow up to that. I guess you also need to set up the imaging infrastructure and the uh, data analytics infrastructure, which I wonder if that's the bigger barrier to entry at the moment. Oh my God. Oh, that's such a good question. So the, the imaging part of it, I think is, I mean, yeah, you still need an imaging core for it to be like production level, but smaller labs are able to do it. And I'm gonna try to, uh, I'm gonna try to see if I can send you the link right now, but I, I don't wanna disrupt this too much. But the, like just last week, I met with this, with this group um, 
uh, uh, Manu Prakash's lab in, in Stanford sort of created this very small, uh, small as in like compact microscope. Which I think they're gonna sell for something like $100,000 or less, something like that. And essentially you can just do cell painting on that at, it seems, it seems like at the, almost at the same scale um, as like these much more expensive microscopes. Um, I, I hope I'm getting some of them, I'm getting that, that number right. It's, it's really cheap. So, so if you have microscopes like that coming out, then uh, it should be fairly easy for doing things at production scale, but you don't really need a fancy microscope, number one. But I think the data analytics part, that's so true. In 2014, we wrote a paper called, it was a review paper called Increasing the Content of High Content Screening. So like nine years ago. And we noted in that one of the big challenges is that data management, like the amount of the amount of data you have to collect, just being able to like keep all these terabytes of images, right, is a, is a pain. And I think that is still, that is, you're right. I think that is still a bottleneck, but the good news is that there are both, you know, there are companies doing it now and there are also open source tools. Uh, the Terra workspace, uh, the, the Terra uh, ecosystem developed at abroad, uh, that team has created a cell painting uh, what would they call it? I think they call it workflows or something like that, uh, which essentially allows you to basically just drop in images, if I'm not mistaken, and run things on GCP on, on Google Cloud. Of course, you pay for the cloud, uh, but it seems like it's gotten pretty close to just being streamlined. Our own, our own sister lab, the Mini Lab, they've created something similar for AWS. So it's getting closer and closer to a push button solution. But of course, you need to pay the, pay the, the cloud costs and things like that. Fantastic, thanks. Okay, I want to quickly run through the remaining questions. Uh, from Dennis Wang, have you done cell painting on co-culture systems like immune cells with cancer cells after perturbing with immunotherapies and look at cell-cell interactions so on, rather than just one single cell death? Oh, yes, yes. So uh, forgive me, the, the exact example doesn't come to mind right now, but there's one with hepatocytes and mouse fibroblasts um, where hepatocytes were grown in a co-culture of fibroblasts. Um, neuronal cells uh, always need to grow along with, with something else. Um, but I think in all those cases, the, the primary, which is only really one cell type we cared about, uh, and the other cell type was more for, uh, the, for, for, for sustenance. Uh, but in terms of having multiple cell types and looking at their interactions, I, I would say, I would say, nothing comes to mind right away. I, I will look out for it. I bet there's something. Okay, I, I guess sometimes you have a feeder layer, but you of cells, but but you ignore that you're saying. But yeah, uh, in, perhaps, in the examples perhaps, that yeah. come to mind right now, yeah, okay. that's right. In the examples that but, come to mind right now, but I, I bet I bet it's like it's such a it's such a uh, enticing thing to do. So I'm sure someone's doing it. <laughs> Makes sense. Good question. Uh, next is from Jagdish Shankaran. Uh, two questions. One is there's a large uh, cell size range for cultured cells. Is there a minimum cell size needed for the morphology to be easily characterized? And the second, uh, I'll take the questions one by one. So why don't you, uh, okay. And yeah. is it, do the cells have to be sparse and adherent? You already said suspension is okay. Do the cells yeah, have to be sparse? Yeah. Cells have to be, yeah. So I think something like 80% confluence is what we aim, aim for. Um, some labs though are like recursion uh, pharmaceuticals, which has its entire business model based on the cell painting platform, really, uh, they actually do like surprisingly dense. Uh, I mean, like, they, like the, the cell density seeding is just ridiculously high. The cells are touching. So they solve the problem slightly differently. They don't really solve the segmentation problem directly. Um, but uh, yeah, so they can be fairly dense. They just should grow, they should grow, grow in a mono layer so that you can see it. Um, but yeah, I was surprised how dense it can be and still get information out of it. But the other question was, uh, sorry, the other question was- The size, size range. Yeah. If, if, if the cells are tiny, is that a problem? So the cells should spread out. Like if they sort of ball up, that's a problem um, because then they don't really express their morphology, so to say, which is why you might wonder like how do suspension cells work? And I don't know the answer to that, but Spring Discovery's uh, team has figured out a way to just get them to stick and like flatten out a little bit. Um, but the cell size, no, that's a good question. If five or nine is probably a smaller cell, gone with so bit, i guess like you know five to ten microns in diameter but like much smaller ones like we tried with bacterial uh with, with bacteria and that that is like hard that is super hard you can't go that small um uh so i don't actually have a number strangely enough but uh yeah 
Uh, Fair enough. But I guess you're saying if the cells are uh, sitting as a roughly spherical ball, then you don't get much information. You don't get much information. You can just think of it as, yeah, you know, they need to express their morphology by spreading out a little bit and they're all balled up. And at least using the dyes that we have and the kind of imaging resolution we typically use, yeah, that'll be hard. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's very useful. Okay. Next question is from C. Xian. Uh, how well does it work on hmm, organoids and tissue slices? Oh boy, yeah. So um, the so how well does it work? So there is the the Rivron lab in um, in Vienna that is using a modification of cell painting dyes to mark uh, to to study uh, synthetic blastocysts, um, and you know we're sort of just using it more as a characterization right now there, uh, and it seems to be fine. And like it's a major adaptation of cell painting. I think only two out of five dyes maybe at that point is no longer cell painting. <laughs> So organoids seem fine. Like that's one example. There are a few others that um, don't come to mind right away. There's a liver on a chip example as well. Um, sorry. So the uh, organoids and the other question was uh, what organoids and uh, actually tissue slices. Tissue slices. Yeah. So I don't actually have a good example yet of tissue slices. So Hyla, please uh, send me any if you come across them. I'm curious about the lat the former the organoids. How do they work? You just place the organoid. I mean, you have to section the organoid, but like, how does it work in cell painting? Oh, oh. So in that case, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> in the in the the case, the example I had in mind. Uh, so there, we just use uh, two fo two photon or confocal microscopy to image uh, single sections, Z sections, and you know, four channel imaging is fine. Um, the the challenge really is with the 3D imaging is always the standard things. The attenuation of signal, the z-axis and isotropy and all those things you need to deal with anyway. Uh, but there's nothing fundamentally fundamentally challenging about cell painting per se. It, the challenges are really with 3D. And once you have the high dimensional information from every cell, high dimensional here being whatever multi-channel, then you can do what you want with it. In this case, they're trying to see if they can look for early markers of the breakage of asymmetry in the early embryo. So the idea is that can you slowly start seeing like morphologies change depending on whether it's the polar or mural regions. That, that's a good point about virtual sectioning and confocal. Yeah, yeah. um, okay, Jay Shin, uh, how is morphology and the, its inferred gene expression features, uh, you know, how, how does it change between, okay. So between in vitro and in vivo, which is similar to the question I had, because these are drugs. Yeah. A lot of what you showed is drug screening models. And, uh, you know, at least a, a drug can work well on a sculptured cell and not work well in a mouse, or work well in a mouse and not work well in a human, and so on. Yeah. So th th that's a question about how representative it is. I guess. Right. <clears throat> how, okay. Yeah. So how representative is the profile in general, or is it the, the link to gene expression prediction? Or I, I guess anything. So yeah. you're using various perturbations, <clears throat> either genetic perturbations or oh, drug yes. perturbations <clears throat> to say, right. and using cell morphology in vitro as a readout to make right. some judgment about what is this drug doing to your body ultimately? Yeah. Directly you're saying, what is it doing to the cell? Indirectly, you're saying what's it doing to your body? So, how transferable how is that information? Transferable is it? No, that's a great. And I think this sort of just goes down to the fundamental question about you know scientific reproducibility, like do do or, or translatability of all these results, right? So the the sort of uh, the philosophy we have had, and you know, I guess the the wisdom of it will only pan out over the next few years to see how it actually does. Is that you know at the end of it, like we're sort of if you have a model system of of whatever we have, the biological system we really care about, which is the human body, right? And we've sort of massively simplified it. There's so many artificial steps. We're like growing, growing, growing cells on plastic, right? Um, and then looking for things that are, you know, potentially what we <laughs> sort of find drugs using that. It's a big, big leap of faith, right? But for, you know, in, in all the analysis that we do, uh, we are only ever, at least our labs, only ever looking for sort of relative changes. So for example, if we were doing something like using cell painting to test whether a specific like 
marker of disease in a cell that is visible in a, in a human, if that is rescued, you know, that would be problematic because now you're, look, now you're really, you, you're, the translatability of this model would be important. But usually what we are, the, the way we're approaching it is that we're trying to stay within the system. So for example, within that system, within that, this artificial system that we have, uh, if we overexpress a mutant, variant of the a, a, a mutant version of a, of a gene and your express wild type version if you sort of see differences between the two then you know that comparison within that same space uh, leads to a hypothesis that maybe in a human like may, maybe in vivo uh, this would still hold we're trying not to sort of make comparisons between in vivo and in vitro we're trying to always make it within the same system such that we can then say okay we're seeing it here uh, the differences that we see here may translate to differences there and after that, it's a really a, a Hail Mary after that, because then, you know, it's not as though we'll be making uh, clinical decisions based on this. This is sort of, you can think of it in some, in the simplest case as a hypothesis generator, in a more sort of uh, nuanced case as a, as a primary screening method of sorts. Uh, so yeah, we, we're never really, um, we're never really going to claim that there's complete translatability. We're always going to try to uh, use it as a way of getting a hit list of compounds, hit list of genes that can then be further probed. Uh, okay. Along that line, by the way. Well, well like, as you said, it's used to generate, essentially narrow the list of things you'll test. But test where, I mean, is the next step uh, a mouse model? Like what's, what's a logical next step? It's a logical next step, right? So it depends on, it depends on the, it depends on the project. So uh, the, 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 the YAP inhibitor thingy that I told you about, um, so there, <clears throat> we have now a bunch of a bunch of compounds, <clears throat> a bunch of compounds that were able to kill the sarcoma cell line. Uh, so now the, the next step there is to launch a company. So now Anne and Karen have launched a company, and now they're going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, we have a bunch of compounds that seem to kill the cell line, and this is the 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 the, the disease we care about. And I believe at this point onwards, they will basically start from. I wouldn't. It will not be step one, obviously. But it'll be with a very solid hit list, and then going through whatever um, the experts that they that, that they recruit would consider to be the appropriate path for developing this into a drug. And I don't know the exact details that'll emerge there, but essentially, you know, it's now is a very good starting point for saying that hey, we have this bunch of drugs; they seem to be hitting certain targets, and let's now develop this. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, but another example, the rare diseases example, that's very different. So there, uh, we're mostly looking for, we're trying to screen for drugs that may revert the disease phenotype of rare diseases. And all these drugs are known drugs. They all have, <clears throat> I mean, they, they've all passed the toxicity uh, 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 sort of baseline uh, and uh, yeah, admit sort of baselines. Uh, so, but what we're looking for is a new indication for that drug if for a rare disease. So in those cases, my understanding is that uh, the the process is much faster. So now you know, uh, in the in the in the most extreme of cases, you know, if it's a rare disease, a clinician has the authority to look at data like this, and just say that okay, you know, it seems like the downsides are low, the upsides could be high. There's no drug in the market for this disease. I am going to make a judgment call and just prescribe. Uh, it's a little scary to think that they may be based, based on like one paper or something like that, but it can be something as simple as that, as simple as and as quick as that. Hasn't happened yet in my experience, but it can be as quick as that. Now, the less faster approach would be that uh, <clears throat> FDA has a much faster route for re for drug re for repurposed drugs, so you can sort of just go through the only the the last couple of phases of the clinical trials. Uh, but yeah, sorry. So lo long answer to the question that it depends on the project and the path would really depend on you know how big a risk it is to just follow up on that. Makes sense. Uh, Mohua, uh, is it possible to predict immune phenotypes from the morphology of immune cells? Let's say the T cell phenotype in a tumor. Uh, and is there anything being done in that direction using cell painting? Uh, predict the morphology? Uh, I'll, I'll so so uh, from the morphology, you predict the, say, the immune phenotype. So is it an is it an exhausted T cell, for example? You know that can uh, yeah yeah um, just by looking yeah, at the morphology. I, great great question. I I don't know. Um, I know a couple of labs. I think again, this is probably probably Spring Discovery comes to mind that has done something along these lines. But sorry, no, I, I haven't seen any examples of that. Because because then I, normally immune phenotype 
is defined as molecular markers. But then if you turn, could turn them into morphological markers, then uh, open up some avenues for mechanistic. Oh, absolutely. Avenues. Yes. So Jesse Bonflab uh, at MIT, I'll, I'll try to pull it up uh, if I can. I believe they're doing something along these lines. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, <clears throat> fantastic. One more question from Jay Shin. Any advice or uh, guidance and challenges on creating a consortium with a multinational company while publicly sharing the data? So just, yeah. you, know, you, you must have walked down that path, so. Yeah, 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 this was, yeah, this was the most um, exciting non-science non -science challenge that I faced in, in my career. And a lot of it was really the brainchild of, uh, of Ann Carpenter and the Coley of our, our lab. Uh, who really championed this in the early days and sort of gave us the impetus to do it again with uh, 3x the number of companies, which is just crazy. Um, so the, the challenges here were, I guess, I guess they were, um, the, the biggest challenge was really the legal paperwork in the end, uh, which thankfully uh, is a machinery that handles it um, in terms of the bureaucracy. But I think the, the advice really I would give is that uh, you know, any consortium like this has to start at the grassroots in the sense that every, nearly every person in the end, every company in the end that was part of this consortium um, uh, joined it because they were scientists who were invested in this idea and who knew each other uh, through conferences, through collaborations, probably being in each other's company. Um, and we're just sort of a group of interested colleagues and scientists who really felt that this is something that they should work on together. So it has to start at the grassroots level. I've heard of consortia like this starting top down, you know, like the, 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 the big shots meet and they say, oh, you know, we should do something cool together. And then they sort of go top down and that, I, I don't think that really works. So yeah, bottom up, you know, find, find friends who are willing to uh, work together on something fun and then build it up into a consortium, I would say is broadly uh, the advice I'd give if you're doing something like that. Public she publicly sharing data was a, was a mandate from us. Like we were required to by our um, commitment to the broad to share it publicly, but our, our own lab has also always followed that practice that we try to make as much publicly available as possible. So we sort of wrote that in very early on into the a consortium agreement. So people who are going to join, we're going to join knowing that we're going to make it public. And we had a one year uh, embargo period, um, which uh, allowed companies to delve into the data uh, sooner, uh, giving them some sort of a head start here. But their main reason for joining it was really to participate in the intellectual process of creating this data set. Uh, more than just the sort of, uh, you know, this embargo period. I think that was the biggest allure for them. <clears throat> See, I, I'm intrigued by that. So uh, I, did the companies participate in designing the studies? Absolutely, yeah. So from, you know, we had nine work streams working um, in, in in coordination. Every work stream was led, turned out by a, someone from a different, from, some, someone from one of, one of each of the companies. So there was complete involvement there. Um, the assay development, you know, we had to sort of fine tune the cell painting assay because it was an opportunity. Uh, it was, I think, primarily led, uh, at least co-led by, um, by folks at Merck, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so yeah, it was a very, very collaborative effort. Data analysis, I would say at this point, uh, our colleagues at Bayer and Janssen and AstraZeneca have just sort of raced ahead in terms of doing, like creating some amazing models for representation learning and so on. So um, yeah, it was uh, extremely distributed, I would say. That's fascinating. And then having generated the data, did, you know, let's say each company you're saying, driving one assay, one project, did they all throw all the data into a central pool that all the companies had access to? Yes. So uh, in, in the pre-competitive, in the exclusive well month yeah. period. Exactly. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we had set up a bucket, an AWS bucket, um, and they would just deposit all the data in there. The only understanding was that you can't have access to, you can access everyone else's data only on, only after you've deposited your own. So there was that agreement. Um, so, you know, it's sort of an, an incentive to deposit yours quickly. And that worked out fine. Um, I think in the end, like most people, just because of COVID and all those other things, this one year embargo turned out to be not really uh, effective because like things just got delayed quite a bit. Um, so in the end, I think the only one or two companies really had any sort of true advantage of the, took advantage of the embargo period per se. But yes, people were depositing data, uh, they were sharing results and all those things over the three year period uh, continuously. Yeah, and these are all companies and our you know, potential uh, competitors, I guess, doing this, so that was amazing. Uh, we're running out of time. One last question on this topic. 
So in the data analytics itself, you know, there are multiple models. One is a company say, okay, I am my own data analyst. I know what to do. I'll just do it myself. Or do they collaborate with you? What do they do a little bit of both for the data analysis? Um, yeah, I, I believe I would say, yeah, definitely a little bit of both. There were some companies that were just, uh, you know, ready to go. They have been doing this for the last like 10 years. They didn't need anyone else and they could just do it. And they were very, very gracious to offer their inputs to others as they were going along. Um, a lot of it was really led by us primarily because we were the hub. So we were sort of, uh, we had the responsibility of uh, pushing the data analysis. Uh, so we would, you know, on a weekly or uh, biweekly basis, share those results. So then people would sort of ask us questions and um, yeah, we would just sort of share share insights from that. So I'd say it, I'd say it, it was a bit of both. I was encouraged to see how many labs were already, companies were already set up to do their own data analysis. Um, I would say that was still the biggest challenge in terms of coordination. I mean, I, you know, we'll see now how we do it in the Oasis Consortium, but coordinating data science activities across like 10 companies is, is not easy. And so it was more of a hub and spoke model really in the end. Certainly. A uh, question from Madan Tangavelu, uh, which I half understand. Could you suggest the best method to determine the emergent cluster? I'm not sure what emergent cluster means. Um, concentration response studies using self thinking. Mm. I presume that's a toxicology study. I'm not sure. I see. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer the question as I understand it. Um, so concentration response, I'd imagine you're sort of talking about a dose response um, and you're looking at not one cell painting profile of a compound, but a cell painting profile of a sequence of doses of compounds. And there's some work done by Ed, uh, some folks in Edinburgh have shown that you can sort of, um, I'll, I'll try to paste, I'll, I'll, I'll just send you the link, Sham. It's a, it's a paper that has a, has a way of doing it. And it's actually not very straightforward. It's a, it's a, good, it's a good question. I, uh, there's no standard way of doing it, but people have some ideas on how they analyze data that is across those points. Got it. Uh, question from Liu Bosian. How much expression variability can be explained by the emerging features? So are, are there genes whose expression is better predicted using emerging imaging features than others? And how many genes can be very accurately predicted Ooh, in expression I would, I would by the point, I would point Liu to our paper, uh, and I'll, I'll share the link uh, with you, Sham, uh, of our, of our slides such that uh, Liu can go and look at the what we call the Rosetta uh, paper, so Nature Methods, Hagigi 2022, in case you want to just look it up. Um, but all, this is all answered in that paper. It seems like it's uh, perfectly uh, out of that paper, actually. <clears throat> and a short answer is how predictive is it? Oh, um, so short answer, it is um, about, from, out of about 900 or so genes, it was something like 10% uh, were highly predicted. And if, I think high was 0.8 or 0.7. And remember, this is like these are baseline results. So the whole purpose of the paper was not to establish the best mess method, but rather to say, hey, there's data out there using the baseline method of like lasso regression or something. I forget what we use. Uh, this you can get this much. So presumably you can do that. And, and perhaps the genes that were better predicted, they represent the subset of cellular phenotypes that cell painting can access, right? So this is a question in my mind. There must be phenotypes that you cannot see from morphology. And can that gene set guide you to what you can learn and what you cannot learn? From oh, yeah, that's a great. Exactly. So we did some ore expression uh, ORA analysis in this, um, and uh, it sort of gave, gave us some insights. But we didn't really probe that too much. But you're absolutely right. Knowing what genes can be predicted might actually give us some insights into what what, what aspects of um, cellular state uh, cell painting is capturing. But yeah, great great way of thinking about understanding cell painting. But we didn't do that too deeply. Got it. Uh, okay, simple question from an anonymous attendee. Can you show the last slide again? Uh, sure, I, I'm happy to share all the slides uh, right after this. So please uh, just give me a second and I can uh, I, I can send that to you, Sean, that's okay. And then you can share it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, uh, well, I don't, it's an anonymous attendee, so I don't know who to send it to. Oh, oh okay, ah, sure, please. There go you go, thanks. Uh, and oh, one sorry. more question from an anonymous attendee. Um, oh yeah, so there's a link to the PDF of the slides that's so useful. Um, and, and that'll be up in about 10 minutes. I didn't have the time to do it yet. So just give me 10 minutes and we'll be up there. Brilliant, brilliant, that is so useful. Uh, last question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, okay, and we're out of time, but if you can give a 30 second answer. I'm can speak a bit more about what you found to be the most informative morphological features and how do these features correlate with each other? 
Yeah, gosh, this is such a hard question because I wish there's a simple answer. I was surprised how much information is there in cell shape, um, just cell shape, nuclear shape, cell shape. Uh, if you wanted one channel, if you wanted to stay in one channel, I would say stay in the DNA channel. Uh, but in general, you found like the, the information is really spread across the board. And, um, it, you know, if you want to narrow down to narrow down to channel or set of features, I would say maybe DNA and shape features or something. Usually we don't really care so much about Compressing it, compressing, well, but reducing the number of features you measure because that's just a computational um, question. You know, you can extract whatever you want. But yeah, channels wise, I, I would I would bet on DNA. Okay, got it. Uh, I have many more questions, but we're out of time. Hope to continue the conversation Absolutely. with you, Shantanu. Mr.